just a little bit of introduction. Um, KYC, increasingly grown importance over time. Regulatory expectations have grown through a number of um, events around money laundering scandals. The cost of prevention for industry and supervisors uh, has, has grown with that. Uh, many of these scandals have tended to um, involve a cross-border nexus as well. On the surface, KYC is an issue where there's broad alignment between the private and the public sectors in terms of objectives, namely enhancing fraud and AML detection as efficiently as possible. The challenge is how best to achieve this uh, and in the most effective way, particularly given some of the trends around increased switching, uh, greater ability of firms to servicing clients across borders, um, and these are both driven by um, policies encouraged by policymakers um, in previously and, and, and um, in, in the future, as we've just heard from, from Commissioner. Um, so joining me to discuss these issues, I've got um, uh, a group of people um, who, who are um, far more um, distinguished to discuss these issues, I think, than, than myself. So we've got Jan Sessens, who's the head of digital finance unit, DG FISMA, European Commission. Uh, we've got uh, Marias um, Jogulis, who's a board member of the Bank of Lithuania. We've got Emmanuel Ivanovic, who's a deputy CEO of um, Abu Dhabi Global Markets, which is the uh, financial services regulatory authority there. Alison Russell, who has just taken over as the head of the innovation department at the UK Financial Conduct Authority. Matt Henderson, who's the business lead for EMEA, uh, for Stripe and Richard Bloor, who's the CEO of KY3P IHS Market. So, so um, let me j j just give a broad overview of the discussion about what we try and aim. And then, Jan, I'm going to hand over to you. So the discussion is going to aim to explore how the industry can benefit from a harmonious regime. Should it be public? Should it be private? Should it be a combination? Uh, what are the types of issues um, that, that we should be looking for for an efficient and effective KYC onboarding solution? Should it be limited to authorization or extended to other areas? And then importantly, Jan, what about the EU digital ID? Does that actually potentially make KYC easier? So I don't expect, Jan, for you to address all of those, but I think what would be useful just in your opening remarks would be just to outline the broader context of the Commission's work uh, particularly on EID, and also maybe just touch on the contribution of the public sector in, in terms of the cross-border aspects of KYC and digital onboarding. So over to you, Jan. Yeah, good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for the kind introduction and looking forward very much uh, to, to discuss these aspects. I think uh, Commissioner McGuinness has just, uh, let's say, given you a detailed outline indeed on the European Commission's priorities in the broader area of digital finance. And uh, so very, very looking forward now to dive into one of them specifically, which is an important one. Um, and it is important, it is important one for a number of uh, reasons. I think, uh, Daniel, you already mentioned the immediate actually regulatory and uh, let's say compliance challenges here. This is an area uh, which where there is a lot of, uh, it, it is very important for, the, for, for money laundering, for market integrity. Uh, it is at the same time uh, uh, num the, the area where when we discussed and consulted uh, uh, markets for our digital finance strategy, this was the number one issue where people were de uh, deploring market fragmentation, regulatory fragmentation. Uh, so it is certainly something uh, to be looked at very closely. Um, and that for uh, both for, for the immediate reasons, the relevance of this for, uh, let's say, KYC compliance, but also for the broader picture, because digital onboarding is still uh, uh, the the key to to, to many uh, uh, products, financial products. Uh, but uh, I mean, the expertise and the knowledge you develop in this area is uh, also very relevant uh, uh, beyond the financial sector. And in that sense, as we are seeing markets actually to more and more integrate uh, between different sectors, uh, also important asset indeed, uh, the experience uh, which the financial sector has in this uh, area. Um, and importantly, it is something, if this works seamlessly, works well, this is something where consumers can really see the added value, the benefit of digital finance, actually, uh, whether it's in a pandemic situation or beyond that. So it is, it is really, it is important for, for compliance, it's important for banks' risk management, but it is also important for broader, let's say, business development and, uh, let's say, uh, broader, actually, citizens' perspective. Um, uh, so what, uh, in light of these, uh, uh, let's say, considerations, indeed, 
Um, this is one of the big priorities of the European Commission's digital finance uh, strategy, which we brought out in September. And what is it uh, very shortly but from the Commission side we, uh, we want to do, uh, based indeed on the advice we got from the, from the Rofiak expert group, also a specific expert group we set up in this area, uh, and from the family consultation. I think there, there are three steps I want to mention. The first one is indeed, uh, as we will now come forward with a, a new uh, anti-money laundering package, we will indeed uh, uh, bring significant further harmonization actually into the uh, uh, AML rules on this, uh, on this matter. Um, the second thing is legislation is good and is, is the best, the most effective way to, to, uh, to actually harmonize and achieve convergence, but it takes a bit of time. So in that sense, for that reason, we already uh, tasked indeed the European Banking Authority now to, indeed to work on guidelines uh, to achieve already on the base on the existing rules, uh, additional supervisory convergence on those matters and work on this is ongoing and will actually conclude still this year. Um, the third element uh, is then indeed the broader picture beyond immediately the financial sector. Uh, we will integrate these solutions also into the upcoming review of the EIDAS uh, uh, regulation and the broader European e-identity, which also uh, our president indeed uh, announced and put a lot of reference, uh, strength on and emphasis on uh, in her State of the Union speech in, back in September for this year. Uh, so indeed, uh, as the Commission is also finalizing developing a legislative proposal on this, we'll also make sure indeed uh, the idea is very much to extend the use here to the to the private sector as well, and we make sure that indeed the specific uh, KYC uh, uh, related needs uh, are also very well reflected there. And in that sense, together, let's say this, the, the, the specific rules and on anti-money laundering and indeed the broader EADAS framework should provide a very good uh, solution uh, here overall. Now that's from our perspective, in a nutshell, the most important, uh, let's say, actions which we announced on this. Um, and, but it is, of course, once uh, those things uh, are out there, it will be very much up to the market indeed also to play its role, because you also asked about the pub public and private divide on this year. Uh, I, I think there are so many different, let's say, needs and different, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, areas and different uh, also issues, technologies to consider that it, it is for the market indeed to, to, uh, to develop and actually to use this framework uh, uh, once it's up and running. I think we see already many promising projects. Uh, I think today they're mainly at a national scale and I think partly regulatory obstacles are a reason for that. But I think also beyond that, I think uh, indeed uh, then uh, uh, operators need to start thinking indeed uh, on how actually on the business perspective, once the regulatory obstacles will be, be gone on a business from a business perspective, how do we actually also uh, develop cross-border, uh, uh, let's say, cross-border identification, onboarding schemes? Uh, how do we do with cross-border KYC matters, et cetera? Um, so I think that's then very much also up to the financial sector to play an important, uh, uh, important role here uh, and indeed to be part of this uh, solution and this work and essentially the main part in the end. We can enable, but in the end, it will uh, actually be for the private sector to, to play its role here. Thank you, Jan. We'll, we'll, we'll come on a little bit later to, to get Matt and Richard's views around uh, what, what you've just said about the, the, um, the, the private sector and what matters particularly at, the, at this sort of design st stage. Um, you, you're, you're correct, there is an awful lot of innovation in, in this area. Um, Matt Marius, maybe, maybe I could just turn to you with your um, supervisory hat. Um, <clears throat> what, um, you know, what, what's your perspective around the sort of concept around KYC, you know, particularly maybe a utility. Do, do you advocate for public-private partnership? And I think also some of the, the complexities that um, you've seen as a supervisor, what, you know, how do you, um, what, what would make it, in, in terms of the actual detection from, from a supervisory perspective, what, what matters most um, to um, your, your central bank? Thank you, Daniel, for having me on the panel. So first of all, uh, um, I would uh, agree with what has been already said that the potential of uh, having harmonized solution of how we authenticate uh, users uh, across uh, the single market is huge. But having said that, uh, we also should not overstretch uh, what this uh, initiative can achieve because there are other initiatives which complement that and in combination, they can lead to the objectives of what the commissioner and what Jan has just uh, referred to. So uh, do we have uh, any view on uh, how should it be done? Um, 
Yes, uh, I believe that we already have uh, quite a few solutions in the market. Um, and uh, in several countries, there are multiple electronic identity schemes available. And actually the problem is having a, a single framework. How do we uh, integrate that across uh, the single market? Uh, not to mention the issue if we have to deal with uh, cross-border uh, identification of customers. Um, and uh, here I mean uh, beyond the European Union. Uh, and the issues uh, that uh, regulated firms and technology providers that have a dealing uh, with this uh, question are along the three dimensions. Uh, the first one is the legacy systems. Uh, that is that uh, many market participants already are integrated with multiple EKYC solutions. And uh, for them, uh, it's always the question, is that another yet integration that, ha that I have to implement, it, it better be the last one. Um, so Jan said uh, that, uh, you know, it will be legislation, hopefully, and uh, that will settle, settle it because uh, at the moment, uh, the way the AIDAS uh, uh, directive works is that each uh, member state has to designate a specific a kind of a scheme, which uh, is uh, then accepted uh, in, in other countries. Uh, but that is not for certain if that particular solution that you're using uh, will be accepted in, in another jurisdiction. So legacy systems, uh, kind of the sunk costs that uh, firms have done, uh, I guess has, that has to be addressed. Uh, the second point uh, that comes up in these discussions is uh, the legal uncertainty. So I believe that with this initiative, uh, European Commission will settle this issue. Um, and with legal uncertainty, I mean, uh, uh, having legal certainty of uh, what are the implications of onboarding or passporting uh, uh, or transferring the identity of a customer across the borders. And why is that important? For the third uh, point, uh, which is uh, uh, the liability aspect. If something goes wrong, uh, is it the liability of the provider uh, who provided that technical solution or even uh, if it is a shared uh, identification of customers across uh, uh, different segments of the market, uh, you know, the, the customer can be identified uh, when it's onboarded for banking services, but uh, then he goes on to, you know, linking to the today's discussion, you know, to, to be onboarded on a European Robinhood, uh, do we, you know, identify him again? And that also poses uh, other interesting questions. Can we utilize this, uh, this process for other regulatory purposes uh, like the market fitness test? But I, I delay that to our further discussion. Just, just one point, Marius, just to pick up on something you said around the legacy IT. Um, you know, as a supervisor, uh, I, I guess you get oversight. In fact, you may even well uh, be involved in the approval of large IT projects for the banks that you supervise. I mean, it's certainly something that uh, the ECB under the SSM has written about, about the problem of legacy ITC. Is, is there not a role there of, of, of um, if, if KYC is so important of actually asking the firms that you supervise to prioritise these types of issues? Absolutely. And in our regulatory processes, uh, we do these uh, yearly uh, uh, risk evaluations. And uh, as of late, uh, uh, at least a couple uh, significant financial institutions uh, have received uh, not a stellar evaluation at that particular aspect. And um, we also, as a supervisor, uh, well, maybe it's a specific case for the Bank of Lithuania, we act as an ombudsman for uh, consumer protection purposes. And uh, the complaints uh, from the uh, individuals on not being able to log in because uh, the authentication service is not working uh, is increasing. Uh, so it's not only the technical issues, not only the legal aspect or single market, uh, you know, big, big question. At the consumer level, you know, it's always about uh, having access to the service uh, in, in a reliable way. And if we're going to be relying on that service uh, uh, in the forthcoming future, and that will be a unified kind of uh, hardcore European solution, uh, it better be resilient because otherwise uh, there will be private uh, 
initiatives uh, pop popping up, which will provide uh, yet another better service. Thank you. <clears throat> um, you Matt Maris mentioned the third country issue or the, the non-EU leg. Uh, at this stage, I want to bring in uh, Emmanuel just, just to talk about the experience around um, Abu Dhabi, um, but both in terms of uh, the work that they've been done in, uh, been doing on um, EKYC, uh, but also how they're tackling these issues more broadly. Um, uh, so, so, so Emmanuel, could I please just hand over to you? Thanks, Daniel. Um, thanks for having me. Um, just on a global perspective, from a ADGM, Abu Dhabi Global Market perspective as well, we, we're well aware of the United Nations Sustainable development goals and and in particular in this part of the world i mean the idea is to provide legal identity for everyone so regardless of what level or class you're in so the idea of regulated digital id is really important and we think there's a lot of benefits in that because it's going to ease the ability of the unbanked to access banking products for example it becomes more cost effective and it'll actually lead to the financial sector in the region, which is not developed enough to grow. So these are some of the key aspects of that. Now, from, from our perspective as Abu Dhabi Global Market, what we did was back in March of 2018, we took the initiative to bring together in partnership with a number of different stakeholders, predominantly the banking industry, but are regulators others to work through what we wanted to develop in terms of a proof of concept. And the proof of concept really pushed ahead with the idea of a utility. How that utility was operated and who operated it are questions that are still to be answered, uh, but we're working through that. And importantly, through that initiative that we designed, um, with various stakeholders. The Central Bank of the UAE now has really taken charge of this from a completely countrywide perspective. Um, the MENA as a whole will be tackling this. And, and the, uh, even last year, the Arab Monetary Fund came out with quite a comprehensive report on EKYC um, in the region and the need for it. So it's a really important, quite a topical subject here in the region. And uh, we're really taking some progressive steps. We've also had one of the leading um, innovation centres, Hub 71 here in Abu Dhabi, working through these issues as well. And they released a white paper on this last year as well. So we're all working together um, towards that common goal. But I, I accept there are challenges. There are challenges around things such as, you know, confidentiality, uh, tech, you know, legacy IT, you know, there's, there, are, there are a lot. Um, when we look at the current problems, however, from a customer perspective um, as well, as a, as a potential inhibitor to growth, these are, these are concerns as well. So we need to overcome them in some form or other. Otherwise, we're going to lose a huge opportunity, not only um, from a consumer perspective, but also from, a, from a, an economic perspective uh, regionally and even countrywide. So some of the things, I mean, I'm not going to go through the current problems, but those problems that are faced in Europe that have, people have touched on, I mean, we have the same problems from the costs of onboarding, the time, the poor customer experience, you know, the variation between different financial institutions. One of the things in this region over the last few years in particular, um, KYC has become very, very stringent. Everyone is very, very conscious of money laundering, terrorist financing. That's been developing over the last 10, 20 years, but in the last four to five years, it's even taken a, a further leap forward. It's probably some of the, the most rigid and stringent KYC programs and processes implemented. So when I think about eKYC, I always, as a regulator, I always think what are the key risks that are going to expose the marketplace and a risk that the regulator needs to somehow mitigate. So obviously the first one is money laundering and terrorist financing. That's probably the number one risk for everyone globally. So how do we do that? We, have, we all have quite strict regulatory frameworks. 
around that. Our expectations of our financial institutions are, are, are very strict and rigid. How we supervise it has to be effective. Um, so there are other risks, though. There's forgery, forgery of people's identification, which leads to a whole host of other problems. Um, and those problems lead into the key one of all is consumer protection. I mean, that's a huge risk. And how do you protect consumers, customers um, from frauds, from other types of activities that are illegal? Um, so we have here um, in Abu Dhabi Global Market constructed very strict, very internationally based um, legislation that takes into account international standards. So whether that's confidentiality of information, whether that's data protection, uh, et cetera. So these are all challenges and the risks around those challenges. But I think through partnerships, I think we, we, we can do that. People talk about having the government as the operator of the utility. Um, there are legal risks around that, but also I think we need to consider other options. And I think a public-private partnership is something that's being considered here in the region amongst different jurisdictions. But in particular, the UAE has been looking at that as well. Um, one of the things that in, in any type of private-public partnership, I don't think you can just look at it from it's going to be the regulators and the financial institutions. I think it has to be much broader than that. It has to be the IT and fintech companies. It has to be even the telecommunication companies have to be involved. And another really important aspect is the, the government instrumentalities that issue legal identification, whether that's the immigration department or whether that's the national ID department that issues national ID cards. Because you need to be able to access information uh, from all those varying uh, places, but at the same time respecting customers' privacy, their personal data um, not being utilised or misused, so to speak. But overall, we think that the benefits outweigh the cons of doing nothing. So we have to do something. What we do going forward um, will carry great benefits and others will talk about the various benefits of EKYC. But from our perspective, it's something that we're, we're, we are working on, uh, but we, we realise some of the challenges, but the not just the cost savings, but the economic growth in overcoming those challenges is too great to overlook. So I'll leave it at that for now and I'll, I'll answer any questions that anyone might have. The, the, just, just one quick one. I mean, people are generally aware of the risks and the costs of the Middle East region from a KYC perspective. But I've not heard of sort of a regional initiative being um, fostered on any, uh, you know, on any other area before. We're used to it in Europe in terms of European initiatives. Is this the first time there's been some it's, sort of it's, regional it's drive? Not region, it's not regional at this stage. It's just yeah. within the UAE, there's a real drive for EKYC. But we see it as something that has to become regional. We know that there are other jurisdictions. The Arab Monetary Fund is really pushing um, this across the whole of the Middle East, North Africa. So we see it as becoming a regional issue as well. So because it'll unlock so much potential in this region uh, that's currently not able to access finance because of the lack of clarity around people's legal identity in some instances. But for the UAE in particular, we're really looking at that, but it's been taken by our federal colleagues and we just, we're working within that but we tried to kickstart that discussion back in March of 2018 because we felt it was such an important initiative. Um, Thank you. Uh, Alison, if, if I could um, turn to you, um, I mean, I think particularly given your role uh, at the FCA around innovation, what, what's the FCA's view, particularly around sort of this concept of public versus private solutions on, on KYC? Sure, thanks for the introduction, Daniel, and for inviting me to be on this panel today. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, yeah, in terms of the innovation, so we, um, since we started the regulatory sandbox in 20, uh, 2016, we've supported 14 digital ID models. Um, we've also got two uh, propositions in our digital sandbox at the moment, um, and we've also supported many other 
uh, providers um, who've engaged with us through things like uh, anti-money laundering tech sprints. We also chair the Global Financial Innovation Network, and that creates a framework for cooperation between financial services regulators on innovation related topics. And we share different experiences and approaches. And the GFIN provides a more efficient way for innovative firms to interact with regulators, helping them to navigate between the countries as they look to scale new ideas. So I guess that's on the innovation side of the work we do. We also see from our regulatory supervision and enforcement work, the, um, the issues and the challenges that surround digital ID. And it just brings home really the global nature of the, um, of the issue. And, you know, on one side, obviously, consumers want to be able to have a quick, easy uh, way to identify themselves. On the other hand, obviously, as Emmanuel and others have spoken about, there's huge risk around terrorist financing um, and other risks such as such as those. So I think from our perspective, having seen kind of both sides and worked really closely with a number of providers um, in around the sandboxes and tech sprints that we've conducted, I think we see the real importance of collaboration. And I think we see the real importance of collaboration between regulators across the world, um, industry across the world, and um, you know, who is supported often, more often than not by tech firms. Um, so I think for us, we do see that it's, uh, you know, it's a real, we live in a global world um, and our, our work has, has told us from some of the enforcement actions, it's never just a, a, a UK issue. They often have, you know, spiders webs that go across the globe and it's really, really important from our perspective to work together um, internationally and work together with all stakeholders, um, and, you know, including the industry and whether they be regulated or whether they be tech firms supporting um, providing regulated activities um, for regulated firms. So absolutely, I think it's really important for collaboration with all interested stakeholders. Thanks, Alison. I might pick up on what you just said with, with um, our two industry speakers in a moment. So, so Matt, a um, couple of th things. I mean, Stripe, I. I assume do not have legacy ITC issues. Um, I hope not. Um, the the, the um, just just coming back to to what was said earlier, but you know, how, how do you see the um, you know the, the problems around KYC? If you, if you if you can adopt what whatever sort of uh, tech solutions you want, um, it, you know, how important is KYC to you in terms of sort of your business model and attracting businesses? What are the implications if we have a suboptimal uh, regime um, for, for, for you and your customers? And I, and I guess just saying what, building on what Alison said, this cross-border dimension, um, again, if, if the EU comes forward with something that's, that, that works well, how important is it to get there to, to the next step to, to be able to sort of have transactions between the EU and, and outside? Great questions. Thanks, Daniel, and uh, thanks for having me on the panel. Um, so to start, uh, in speaking about the importance of KYC, I mean, it's critical to our business. Um, you know, firstly, as part of the, the need to prevent bad actors from coming online and, um, and committing fraud. Um, but secondly, um, doing KYC well is very important for digital inclusion. And, you know, we all know that the, uh, the online economy has become more important than ever. Um, over the past year to, uh, you know, millions of people's livelihoods. And um, we see it very firsthand. So just uh, in Europe, just since the COVID lockdown started, uh, Stripe alone has helped 100,000 new small businesses to uh, start transacting online. Um, and uh, although that's very motivating, um, we also worry about the ones who aren't coming online. And, um, you know, it's, it's, we live in a world still where if you're in a supermarket checkout queue, um, you can see that a lot of people are intimidated by automated checkouts. Um, and, uh, you know, some of those folks are also intimidated by um, uh, whether it's extensive forms or, um, uh, you know, additional um, uh, sort of steps that they have to go through. And so 
Um, you know, various studies have, have shown that uh, it can take small businesses six weeks to go through some KYC and verification steps. And um, unfortunately, I think that's intimidating for some small businesses. So, um, it, you know, the old mental model for um, for KYC was was that it's this dial that you can make things harder up front and uh, as a byproduct, you you prevent fraud, you prevent crime. Um, but one of the great things with technology is you can um, break out of that thinking that it is a dial. We can have both. Um, and it's, it's very important that we pursue both uh, preventing crime and supporting financial inclusion. Um, the, uh, in terms of the scale of the opportunity, um, there was a McKinsey study uh, 18 months ago that suggested that um, a, a strong digital identity solutions um, could lift some countries' GDP by up to 13%. Um, now, th that's enormous, um, and, and I'm sure is an upper bound, but, um, but actually the transition of the economy over the past year um, has now got me thinking that that figure is, is, is probably, um, you know, is probably quite true. And, um, and, you know, part of the key we see to, to um, being able to pursue both of these objectives, um, it, there's been discussion already about the role of, um, of digital identity, um, but we don't think it's the only solution. Um, we, we think uh, it's, it's necessary, but it's also the case that behavioral data is extremely, is extremely important. So, um, to sort of by analogy, if you look at consumer fraud online, um, it is the way that a bad actor behaves on a website, the pattern of the transactions that provides the biggest insight to prevent fraud. Um, and, and again, Stripe alone is, is um, at the moment um, preventing about half a billion euros of, of consumer fraud online every month. And the way we're doing that is with transactional and behavioral data um, that, um, that just adds uh, an extra level of richness. And, and a similar, um, similar thing exists for bad actors on the merchant side as well. So we see that as important. We think that there's potential to explore um, transactional transparency, that actually um, that can be part of um, a, uh, a, a sort of measures to reduce crime that um, still preserves a, a path to digital inclusion for the good actors that we want to help to, to get into this new economy. Um, so, um, so, so those are a variety of things that, um, that we think it, it's, it's just more important than ever that we make progress on those fronts. Thank you. Um, R R Richard, can I um, uh, just turn over to you? I mean, I, so I guess IHS Market, um, you sell your products to numerous um, uh, financial services firms uh, across the EU. Um, what would, what, what do you think make would make the biggest difference in terms of the the kind of, um, I guess the 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 adoption of of a lot of the um, solutions, whether it, whether it's you know, what IHS Market are providing or, or others that are out there, um, in, in terms of enhancing the the effectiveness. What's slowing down this, particularly as Matt has said, if we've got you know, the amount of people moving online now is growing exponentially. Um, you know, how, how do we increase the uptake? Yeah, sure. Daniel, happy and, and, and first of all, thank, thanks for letting me uh, be part of this distinguished uh, panel. Um, uh, great to uh, great to join the conversation because it is a, it's an important conversation, an important discussion. Um, and certainly, I've been around this space for best part of ten years, and 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 a version of this conversation has been going for all of the time that I've been involved. So it's great to see that we're uh, we're, we're making progress. I think, um, and, I'll, and I'll answer the question. I'll talk a little bit about 
what I see as some of the key the key benefits, because there's been some really important points raised by my fellow panelists. But to answer your question, Daniel, what would help with adoption? So I think, you know, if when you look back, as I said, this is not a new idea. When you look back when these type of activities have been tried before and invested before, um, <clears throat> where they where they fall apart, there's probably three or four key things where they fall apart or have fallen apart in the past. I think the the, the number one is um, when you and, and one of the panelists um, mentioned it, I think it was Marius or Emmanuel about some costs, right? So many organisations have spent significant dollars in building out their KYC capability, KYC infrastructure, and have had that examined and reviewed by regulators. Okay, and there's a little bit of if it isn't broke, don't fix it. So to then suggest that they need to make a, a, a significant investment to enhance and improve and start accepting and adopting new standards, it's sometimes quite difficult. So I think there's a sunk cost issue, number one, and just, a, just, just an, an inertia um, that we've got to get moving. I think number two is just around um, the concept of, 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 of single standards on paper is fantastic. Everyone buys into the benefits. Everyone sees that you'll get operational benefit. You'll get um, improvements in your um, risk profiles. Um, you, you, you reduce barriers to entry, you know, as, as Matt was talking about, both for third party vendors um, and for clients. So that, that I think people buy into the benefits. What we tend to see happen is as you start down the route of, OK, let's really build out a solution here. People start to diverge. And it can even be four or five individuals, not even institutions, individuals who have a very specific view of an interpretation of a standard, or they believe something has been done, uh, you know, is a better way of doing it. And before, you know, if you're not careful, that can lead to a divergence. And so you build the infrastructure and then people start to want to do and add their own. So they'll add an extra 10%, 20%, 30%, which really undermines the, the value. And certainly we've seen that in the past where you start off quite nicely converged and, um, and then you see a divergence and that just undermines the benefit. So I think there is people really, really, really have to commit to doing it and then make it operational within our organizations. And then the, 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 the third bit is around regulation and legislation. So we've talked a bit about the different jurisdictions have different regulatory standards and expectations. So even if you harmonize around one standard, the likelihood is you're going to have to have multiple processes to deal with different um, different areas of the world in different jurisdictions. So you, we need we need a solution for that. And then certainly, and this has become much more prevalent since the um, since GDPR um, uh, came into the world. But there is you know there is anxiety around liability for personal and private um, uh, data, and you know where, where that resides, who owns it, who is liable if there is a is if there is a breach. Um, and so we certainly saw a retrenching of some organizations who, who became much more anxious around, OK, I'm, I don't want to rely on a utility or a third party technology solution. This needs to be within my infrastructure. And as soon as you kind of have that within my infrastructure, you lose a lot of the benefit of having you know, the, the transferability. So that, that's based on based on the experience and the conversations that I've had with, with many clients. That's kind of where it falls down. Now, you know, for, for the private sector, how do we. How do we help to address it? Again, I, I, I completely agree with Emmanuel around, there needs to be a partnership between the regulatory agencies, the technology solution providers, um, and then the, uh, you know, the, the, the financial services organizations that will, um, will look to consume and use the, uh, the solutions. Absolutely, 100% agree with that. I also agree with Matt that there's other things we can do. So we're already investing in automation to help people's current processes work better. Um, I agree entirely. There are a ton of extra data points and, and, and intelligence that we can look to gather to identify red flags, patterns of behavior that can reinforce that. I do think there is a um, one thing that we can really focus on is, is almost acting as a bit of a translator and helping to take, you know, and Alison was mentioning there were already 15, 16 uh, standards out there um, just that the UK have been looking at. And, and this is true on the vendor side as well, which is another thing my organization looks after. Instead of trying to, to drive everyone to talk the same language, well, maybe there's something we need to do to use technology to create a translation capability that looks for equivalence and is able to say, okay, we can accept the following 12 standards um, and able to map them against a particular record. So I think there's a lot that we can do within the existing construct, but certainly um, I think the, the, the real power in unlocking the benefits has to come from that three-way um, three partnership. Thank you, Richard. Um, I should just, for, for those um, listening in, you know, please feel free to ask um, questions of the panelists and I'll do my best to put them to them. Um, Jan, if I could just come back to you, 
Um, so, so I mean, this is this is the industry saying actually equivalence would be a very, very good thing. Um, you know, potentially eventually, if you're just picking up on what Richard said, how um, getting the standards right in the EU. Um, you, do, do, do you think that's feasible or, or do, you, do, you, do you think we, we end up in this world where um, there's just going to be such differences about the interpretation um, that it becomes very, very hard to, to build out solutions cross-border? Um, uh, thanks very much, and I think the very interesting and pertinent uh, points made by 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 everybody. Indeed, uh, I think the ones also by from Marius and uh, Richard on the practical challenges. I think that is uh, indeed. I think probably in this area, I mean, the idea of what should be done in, in theory is probably indeed uh, uh, is, is out there since a long time. Uh, uh, somehow we just didn't get there yet. Somehow, so uh, indeed that is something we were very very kind of. Uh, I mean, we are very. Looking at very cautiously, actually, uh, also, and when we, uh, I mean, see what we can, what added value we can provide, and that's, I think, also why on our side, yes, I think there is a strong for call also for legislative uh, kind of harmonization, but we also uh, said, well, we need to start before that, and uh, and uh, it's also about supervisory convergence, and there is indeed, as Richard said, a lot which can be done uh, based on the existing framework, um, and that's why we indeed also asked the EBA to 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 look at that, just to give one example, we've done other things as well. Um, also agree very much uh, with uh, to the uh, the points from from Alison indeed on the, the need for international cooperation. I mean, so I, I focused a bit in the beginning to present uh, indeed what the, the EU Commission is proposing for Europe, but I think that is indeed very important. And uh, there's actually uh, lots of work, of course, ongoing in FATF and other fora uh, uh, on on those matters. Uh, uh, and uh, and I think that's something that's for us always the starting point indeed of our work. Um, so uh, uh, when it comes then, Daniel, to the question, uh, uh, how does it go uh, with uh, with equivalence? How to make different kind of standards uh, from different uh, sources work together? Um, I think I mean I think there are two there are two ways two things here. One is indeed uh, when it comes to the regulatory framework, and there our objective remains, and I think we think also this is ambitious but feasible that we should have a single set of rules on this uh, uh, within the EU. Uh, that's basically what we would propose. Uh, that's of course the regulatory framework. I think then the, the second question indeed is uh, let's say when you come to the how this is implemented and the 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 actual solutions uh, and that goes of course much beyond indeed the, the regulatory AML framework. Um, and there absolutely I think uh, uh, the question of well equivalence interoperability or however you want to call it is 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 a key one. I think that's indeed where, uh, for example, when we look at the EIDA system, uh, uh, the European one, which is right now more active on the public side, that's exactly the principle there, that you basically you notify systems, and Mario described it, there are limits to it, so we want to address this. But uh, those uh, those then are kind of, uh, there's a mechanism to have them make them interoperable indeed with the systems and, uh, notified by other member states, and that's just an example how this will probably have to uh, have to, to work. I mean, we will not see a situation where basically we'll just have a, a, in all the technical details, a single standard, a single system that that's not gonna uh, not going to happen. So I think that's very, very important. But again, I would like to uh, distinguish here between the regulatory framework, the AML framework, where I, I do think that we need a, a strong harmonization and then indeed, uh, let's say that the solutions which actually implement that and the technical uh, specifications of those were probably uh, interoperability is is, is, is is a key word. Thank you. Um, Matt, you mentioned the, the um, sort of uh, the COVID pa pandemic and how that sort of um, led to a drive online and, and, and sort of the increased instance of fraud. I, I just wondered from the regulators perspective uh, or supervisors, um, you know, wh whether it be, um, you know, Li Lithuania, UAE, or, um, or um, the, the UK, have, have you seen this trend um, about increased fraud? Um, and, and, and really, you know, what, 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 what have you done as a consequence to, to, to adjust to that? Is this something that the three of you have observed? So definitely, I guess it comes as no surprise that the activity of online transactions, uh, you know, increased relative to the previous years. Uh, did we see increase incidents of fraud? Uh, not uh, that would you know you know raise you know alarm bells, uh, but that would have you know that should have been expected. Uh, in particular, uh, with the level of uh, 
um, unsophisticated individuals coming uh, on online platforms uh, and you know engaging in activities that they have never dealt with. Um, you know, uh, the commission also referred to some of the uh, regulation which will be introduced uh, to to reduce that risk for people who have uh, who have limited uh, financial skills. Um, so that is a comment uh, from a supervisory perspective. But if I can comment comment on what have been uh, just said about the interoperability. There is another element, uh, I think, that will push the world to think uh, uh, on this file on uh, e-identity and KYC. Uh, and the title of that discussion is Central Bank Digital Currency. I don't want to gravitate the discussion to, to the subject, but just wanted to bring it into your attention that it's highly unlikely that you know, a digital, digital yuan will be technologically or completely immune uh, you know, and not connecting to digital euro, if there is one, you know, we still have to decide. Uh, there's a huge demand, of course, uh, and public pressure. But uh, digital means identity, transactions, need for standards. So that's the place where I, I guess it also will be settled. So I guess, you know, I think from our perspective, I think um, the increase in online activity is actually, I think, probably advanced the 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 innovation in this space. Um, you know, we've had to we've had to innovate, we've had to evolve. Um, so yes, on one side, obviously, it's is a huge increase in online activity, and that that brings with it risks and brings with it opportunity for bad actors. But on the other side, it really has, I think, moved innovation on perhaps a lot quicker than might have might have been had we not had the, the pandemic. I tend to agree with the other two speakers. We haven't really seen or witnessed any um, great increase in fraud or, or forgery of identification at this period, but um, there is some um, thematic type, in, you know, reviews of KYC which is a standard for supervision. Um, and if eKYC is being utilised, then um, supervisors will, of course, um, investigate that as part of their um, thematic reviews of, of a, a particular firm or firms. Matt, Matt, if I could just ask a, qu a question of you about um, a sort of EU digital ID. What would something that would be easily transferable, what would that do to be able to facilitate customer switching? Um, so maybe first I'll add that uh, I think a digital ID is um, uh, sort of a, a net positive in, in reducing KYC as we talked about before. In terms of switching, I think, um, you know, we're fans of uh, users having a high degree of, of choice and being able to more easily um, access different solutions. And, um, and, and one of, um, you know, one of the great innovations in the last um, sort of 15 years in particular has been this move towards um, infrastructure as more of an on-demand model, um, which in turn has seen um, entrepreneurs and existing businesses be able to create things out of these building blocks and be able to move more freely. And so I think switching is, is a part of that. Um, and, uh, you know, for a variety of reasons, it's also, I think, a net positive in an economy if, um, if consumers and businesses feel that they have a variety of choice. Thanks. Um, uh, Richard, um, the, 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 the issue of innovation that, that sort of come through um, that Alison just referred to, um, how has this impacted the types of services that, that you have or, or that you sell? to financial services clients? Yeah, Daniel, good, good question. I was, I was actually chomping at the bit to, to make a quick comment as well on, the, on one of the previous questions. So I, I think we will all be fascinated when there is when the analysis is done at the end of, of, of the COVID period to see you know, the cause and effect. So there are just some levels of due diligence that we couldn't execute because we were remote or we couldn't validate certain pieces of information in particular in the, in the third party risk space, on-site visits suddenly become essentially impossible because you're physically not allowed to be on-site. So I think there's a, there's a, there will be a great piece of work to say, 
in the limitations of what we were able to do, did that result in you know, increased fraud? Did it result in increased incidents and data risk because we weren't able to execute the due diligence programs and the monitoring that we normally have? Now, you know, the time will tell on that. What have we seen in terms of innovation? Well, certainly you know, we've seen many of our clients accelerate their innovation roadmaps. So for example, you know, can, can they get comfortable with accepting digitally signed documents where they haven't necessarily been um, witnessed? Um, yes, they can get comfortable with that. And can we help to, to, to accelerate the delivery of that? Yes, we have done that. In the, you know, in the third party risk space, we, we actually innovated and created um, a remote assessment plus, which took many of the data attributes. We looked at behaviors of third parties and were able to top up what will be a remote assessment to get as close to an on-site as you can without actually physically being on-site, you know, digital sharing, um, live meetings to take a look around particular people's facilities. So I think what we've seen is clients have, you know, for the first quarter of last year, there was a real shock to the system. For the second um, in the second half of the year, many organizations pulled forward ideas um, and investments that they would be willing to make that I think have significantly accelerated their roadmaps. And we you know, have been able to innovate on our side as well, because we know that clients are willing to, to use the solutions. I think, Daniel, the final comment that I'll just make around innovation is um, you know, the, there is the, to, to quote um, the famous line, build it, they will come. You know, innovation is definitely part of you invest and you build capability. Some of it will work, some of it won't. Um, I think what we absolutely have to see is a commitment from um, both financial services institutions and, and, and participants that when we're building out innovation, people will, will look to, to, um, to use it as well. And I think that's where what we've seen in, the, in, in COVID and a reaction to that is people are, are more willing to try things and to see whether they can integrate into their existing processes. So I think that overall it's, it's had an effect to accelerate innovation uh, uh, in, the, in the marketplace and in the industry. Would a utility help in terms of innovation? Because, again, theoretically, when, 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 you, when you think of sort of utilities, um, you, you think that just having an industry utility doesn't always bring the best benefits for sort of competition and innovation over the long term. Yeah, so it's, it's a great question, right? And so in, 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 the, in the third party risk space, my, my organisation, Care by 3P, is, is, a, is, is a utility model. Um, but doesn't mean to say that we, we operate in, in isolation and we recognize that, as Matt says, I think clients increasingly expect to be able to pick and choose and to, you know, and to take one piece of a service, another piece of a service. So I think that modular approach is extremely important. I think the other bit to it is you know, around the equivalence of the standards and, and you know, utilities should be looking to, uh, as much as possible, make you know, cro cross match and make their, their different standards interchangeable so that people can access um, those different uh, profiles as quickly as uh, and easily as they can. Um, but I also think in terms of innovation, you know, the, the, the sense of that the utilities get too big and they get stale because everyone has to be in them to use them. You know, I would challenge that because I definitely think um, that the number of um, you know, smaller tech firms that are starting up to challenge, you know, there are other people that are looking to expand their, 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 their offerings around the fringes of what the utilities do. That's a constant pressure. Um, and certainly from, from our perspective, you know, innovation is one of the top three priorities that I have each year, and we continue to push that. Yeah, yeah. And coming back to the sort of the, the concept of a, a European sort of ID, uh, in EU digital ID, what sort of scope are we, are, are we thinking about? Is, is it consumer or, I mean, we have the LEI um, issue that, that was driven globally um, which actually um, has probably helped quite a lot subsequently. And, 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 and maybe something also just for sort of, you know, in terms of scope for sort of firms, I mean, that would help with a lot of the sort of the corporate mobility of transactions, uh, sort of, of customers as well. It, it, what, what's, what's the sort of, and, and actually the, 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 there, are, there are broader implications you could use this for. It wouldn't just necessarily be for payments. It, it, it could be used for sort of other reasons as well. Indeed, no, I, th I think uh, um, you're, fully, you're fully right, Daniel, that uh, indeed the scope of, uh, well, the, the scope of the work and the, uh, uh, it needs to, needs to go beyond, beyond natural persons. Indeed, I think uh, uh, legal persons' identification and on, onboarding actually it, it presents different, uh, let's say, challenges. And I think we have, uh, well, we've tried to make quite a lot of headway on uh, on this in certain respects uh, with the AMLD5 already, uh, with all the, the register around beneficial, on beneficial ownership, etc. On 
on, on other matters. Um, so that is definitely be part, of the, part, definitely part of our work, both on the anti money laundering side, but also on the EIDAS uh, side. Um, uh, and I think indeed the legal entity identifier is one of the, uh, let's say, the possibilities to make uh, to move forward there. I think one will, I mean, then need to see exactly uh, which kind of solutions actually, uh, uh, which kind of solutions um, actually, how do you say, um, uh, not abide by the standards, but but fulfill indeed the expectations which AML authorities would uh, would indeed have, which uh, is uh, goes of course a bit uh, beyond the mere kind of. Uh, identification or authentication of a, of a person. And then when it comes to payment, indeed authentication, as you refer to that, it's for example, a bit of an easier uh, area. But I think that's, I think where indeed the exact uh, solutions, LEI or others need to be looked at, but, but in principle, I mean, that's very much in the scope of the work. You, you mentioned earlier about, you know, certainly about the AML risk um, in the UAE. And, and I just wonder whether, um, the, the identification of risks it goes beyond AML to to, to other risks for organisations as well that, that that possibly aren't always fully appreciated by by all actors. I just wondered your your thoughts on that. Well, I think um, from a regulatory perspective, uh, the AML risk is always you know a key priority for us, as you mentioned. I mean the forgery of identification of individuals and the use of that forgery for fraud is another significant risk um, that we don't want to be in allowing within our jurisdiction. So we don't want our firms um, to be either conducting that type of activity or allowing someone to utilise them through some forged identification. So they're, 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 those risks are, are pretty standard. Credit risk is another one where we're always conscious of um, our firms um, undertaking proper due diligence and assessment of credit risk from a prudential regulatory perspective. So we have to make sure that, that our firms are ensuring that when they take on new clients, that they do so um, in a proper um, methodology, proper systems and controls, proper policies around that um, onboarding of a new customer and making sure that the credit risk that they're, they're onboarding as well have been assessed properly and factored into um, their prudential capital requirements. So we're, we're always very vigilant of that. One of the things that um, you don't want to see um, happen is that um, the risk appetite of the firm because of the nature of onboarding becomes so difficult and so time consuming that um, let's say a bank, for example, will decide that a certain threshold will be met and if not, we won't be onboarding these clients. So therefore that, that may create problems because there may be a lot of people that fall under that threshold that should really have some access to credit. And we worry a lot about, you know, small to medium sized enterprises. And if you, if you start to squeeze that credit um, through your financial institutions, losing the risk appetite because of different factors, and one of them could be due to going through very rigid and stringent KYC, then there has to be a balance there between the two. Otherwise, the market um, credit access in the market shrinks and that has a, a negative effect I know, you know, we have all these quantitative easing projects that have been undertaken over the last 10 years. And a lot of those from a political perspective were undertaken to make sure that, you know, the, the people that needed credit were provided credit because small to medium enterprise really drives a lot of economies and not just those in Europe or North America, but globally. Um, so when you, when you go down this exercise of, significant quantitative easing and it doesn't really reach the people that it's that are needed to have that access to credit, then it defeats the purpose. Um, filling up large multinational banks balance sheets isn't quite the answer to helping small to medium enterprises because ultimately um, that money has to trickle down into the real economy, which is those, those SMEs and day-to-day -day, you know, mums and dads um, who are looking to access credit to do various things, um, but also to create economic growth. And 
So to me, credit risk is a, is a massive area that may be overlooked in terms of KYC, but there's an element of ensuring that um, your KYC processes are both um, stringent, but also fair and reasonable, as long as they're within you know, the standards that are required, the international standards, whether they're around AML and FATF requirements or whether they're around um, customer confidentiality and data protection, they all have to be factored in. As long as they're met, um, there should be some way to, to alleviate credit throughout the market. Um, so there's a balance act there that I think people need to consider. I think also um, the other big risk is, and I, people have touched on this already, but um, confidentiality, privacy, uh, really important. Again, not just in Europe, but across the globe. Uh, people should be able to consent um, to their information being shared, say through a utility, but that consent has to be clear and those people have to be absolutely clear as to what they're consenting to. So customers, consumers have to be protected in that respect because sometimes it's very easy for people, and I've seen this uh, for many years, especially with the, you know, the, the growth of apps and people have this tendency to accept the terms and conditions with net, without reading them. Most people are never going to read the terms and conditions of most of the apps that are available online. That's never going to happen. It's just not practical. So from a regulator's perspective, that's concerning because even though you've hit accept, if something goes wrong, um, usually it's the regulators that are called upon to sort the problem out. But when you've consented to something that you didn't really know you were consenting to, it causes all sorts of legal problems, but also moral problems as well. So there's a huge moral hazard in a lot of this as well. So there's reputational risk that regulators have to be aware of. There's the moral hazards that are created through some of these practices. Um, so there's a whole host of different things that we have to be um, aware of, but ultimately we, we have to rise to the challenge. And if EKYC can overcome some of the challenges, but mitigate the risks satisfactorily for all of us to be comfortable, then I think it's worthy of exploring and trying to endeavor to find a solution. Thank you. Uh, Marius. I just wanted to come in. I think Emmanuel is bringing really uh, good points here. Uh, it might not be obvious how EKYC or e-identity has anything to do with, uh, you know, uh, quantitative easing or just trickling the money down to the individual or the small firm, <laughs> but it does. But maybe from the point, Emmanuel, which you have been uh, commenting, what we have to ensure, and I'm looking to Jan here and um, others ones who are more closely to the legislative process, to ensure that we do not create a situation where the financial firms will be yet again choosing uh, the, the, the cheaper clients uh, from the compliance perspective, because to onboard the other ones will be yet uh, more cumbersome. Um, so that's something that uh, we definitely need to ensure to not to create a possibility for firms to have different perceptions of costs or at all to think about this um, uh, from a cost perspective. Uh, it, it, it's almost uh, what we discussed uh, just a couple of minutes ago. It's, it, it's a basis, it, it's a utility. You know, this is what must be done if you want to be in the financial services. Um, like uh, um, a bank cannot turn down a, a deposit uh, because that's what the license is for, taking deposits. Mm. Uh, unless, you know, of course, uh, there are some other uh, restrictions. Mm. So onboarding of a client uh, must be as straightforward, as cost efficient as possible to ensure that the issues that Emmanuel brought uh, are dealt with. Cost of doing business, uh, yeah, yeah. And there's a, there's a question just come in uh, actually to, to ask you, which which is um, surprised on the focus of the role of the private sector, given the Danish experience that the public sector has had a key role in ensuring the use of EID by guaranteeing the identity identifier. I just wonder if you would wouldn't mind commenting on that. 
Yeah, no thanks. I would have also wanted to follow up on uh, Emmanuel and on Marius. Um, uh, I, I mean, I uh, fully agree with these uh, with these uh, challenges and this this need indeed. Uh, I mean, this, this is also about uh, indeed uh, uh, access to finance for smaller clients and uh, and uh, uh, not having to pick uh, and choose, in, as you say, Marius, with the cheaper clients. Um, as well, uh, at, at the same time, uh, uh, let's say uh, we, the uh, the route of kind of the light lighter checks on them is also not an option. So indeed, I mean eKYC and uh, the possible kind of benefits this can bring and the more efficient system is the only is is a key way way forward. I think to bring these things together because I think we we, we cannot kind of uh, compromise on the quality of the checks uh, and I think that's not in our interest. It's not in the interest of the banks because there's it's not only a cost issue but it's also a reputational issue so even if uh, maybe you will deal with the costs but uh, if things go wrong reputationally i mean we have seen that it uh, it, it puts you on uh, on the spot a lot so uh, i mean we need to find uh, solutions to basically uh, to square the circle and bring, bring these things to, uh, to um, together um, then on the role of the um, of the public and the private sector i think uh, there is no straightforward answer to that because i think there are what I wanted to stress is that both have a role to play. I set out what we from the Commission side we do, but uh, uh, what I want to stress is indeed that we will not, I mean, it's not us who are going to de deliver these solutions ourselves, literally. Uh, I agree that indeed uh, uh, there are a number of, I think, very promising projects in member states where indeed the private sector and the public sector have actually teamed up. Uh, and uh, developed solutions which can be used both in the public sphere and also in, uh, in, the, in the financial sector. And indeed, I think the, um, the review of the EADAS uh, framework, indeed, which is the one which governs, of course, the use of identification means in the public sector, that will uh, actually also further uh, support and allow these kind of schemes because we indeed want to, uh, let's say, uh, bring in there also the private sector. So I think this is a very good uh, example. I think uh, you cannot always kind of transpose these examples from one member state to the other because the situations on the public side are more different, where be, might be the requirements and the situation on the on the private side uh, uh, may be more uh, comparable, but I mean, the public side is quite different. The requirements are different. The institutional setup is different in all member states. But I mean, we are seeing more and more of these systems uh, uh, blossoming. I just read in the Czech Republic, I think also a similar system is now being developed uh, and there, there are a number of other ones. Um, so uh, I think that's a good uh, that that is a good uh, direction of travel. And then indeed, I think uh, what we from the European level have to uh, have to, of course, particularly watch uh, and and uh, and encourage is also that indeed these systems are then uh, indeed uh, linked up in an in interoperable manner. But that's of course the particular point which we basically from our side actually have to have to look at. But I, I mean, I think there are various. Those are exam good examples. There are also examples of fully private systems which are also working very well. Uh, so, I mean, I don't think that there's really a kind of a, uh, um, there's uh, a kind of a black and white or a, ma a magic, uh, a perfect solution on this one. The only thing I think I, we are convinced about is that, uh, I mean, if you, for, if you uh, work just with the public or just with the private sector, then it's bound to fail. So there needs to be cooperation element of both. Thank you, Jan. Um, so we've only just got a couple of minutes left. <clears throat> Perhaps I can go in reverse order and just um, ask the panelists just to um, have some concluding comments. Um, start starting with you, uh, Richard. Anything you wanted to add uh, the, the, to, to respond to anyone's points? Uh, so, so no, no, look. I think I think from um, from my perspective, the the point that I didn't get a chance to reinforce, which I will do, is kind of my leaving comment, is. We, the, we have to get this right because if we don't the danger is we are raising barriers to entry and we're raising barriers to entry for um, um, individuals to access credit firms to access credit because the the, the risk tolerance of organizations and the cost of, of executing those due diligence make it prohibitive i also think on the third party side you know um, it, it, it is going to create barriers for for innovation within the financial services market because the cost of building a kyc ky3p capability becomes so huge it becomes prohibitive so we have to come up with a set of solutions where smaller organizations can access credit they can do business with financial service organizations but also you know, new financial organizations can access this capability which lets them meet the regulatory requirements in a, in a sustainable way without having to go hire 60 people you know build a big technology infrastructure so i think it's really really important um, for the industry uh, and for the uh, for the economy in general 
Thank you. Matt. Yeah, so I, I wanted to reiterate the importance of, uh, of going beyond EID to things like uh, transaction data and behavioral data and being mindful of that as we, um, as we think about the framework for, um, for detecting, uh, detecting bad actors. The, um, the other thing is, um, I also just wanted to touch on cross-border and um, how much globalization has yet to happen um, we like to think that we're in a, uh, in a in a very globalized world already, but the truth is that uh, I think uh, the the proportion of um, cross border transactions for online businesses is actually a lot lower than it naturally should be, um, given the power of the internet to help connect um, buyers and sellers all over the world and and even within Europe, and we still have a, a tremendous number of um, businesses that tell us that they would um, love to sell into more countries within Europe uh, were it not for the inconsistencies that, that create work. So, so, you know, that's an importance for, for harmonization um, and uh, in, in something that, uh, that we're hoping to come out of progress in this area. Thank you. Um, Alison. Hi, yes. So I think for me, it's, it's really and this conversation has just highlighted how important the collaboration, um, public private partnerships and working together to really um, move things on. And I'm really interested actually by some of Matt's comments around not just about digital ID, but are there other solutions which can achieve the same aims? So I think for me, it's really about development, furthering conversations and um, you know, furthering innovation as we move forward. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. I think for me, it just reiterates the, the, the need for a global perspective on this as well. Um, a global set of standards is obviously critical to allow that cross-jurisdictional expansion of EKYC. Um, I think it's important that if we can test and start to utilise potential utilities and put them into test modes, which people are doing across the globe. And hopefully those will, with global standards as well, culminate um, in, in the utilisation of EKYC, which I think will help global growth across the board. So that's my two cents worth. Thank you. Uh, Maria. Well, I guess our discussion just proved that identity is central. Uh, like you cannot travel if you don't have a passport and passport uh, is standard. You know, the, the color of the cover changes, but what's inside and the rough ID standards inside of uh, the paper are the same because otherwise we cannot check at the border. And that's, that's what exactly it's being done at the financial border. You know, you want to check the identity of the, of the individual and all the associated things that, uh, fair enough, Matt, are also important. But maybe we shouldn't try to address everything at the same time, because otherwise we might not deliver. So my concluding statement would be to ensure that uh, initiative in this particular field across different legislative initiatives right now are aligned. Um, AIDAS, PSD2, MIFID, and beyond financial services, so that the digital identity, you know, the stakeholders from other industries are also involved, and that will make it uh, make it a success, I think. Thank you. Uh, and, and lastly, Jan. Yeah, thanks very much. I, I see actually uh, I'm encouraged uh, and, and confirmed that there's uh, I think a lot of convergence on uh, on uh, where to go and on the principles which should, uh, should guide us. Um, but that does not diminish indeed the the magnitude of the challenge uh, which which lies ahead to actually to to, to simply uh, do what uh, the kind of things which we discussed today here. So from our side, I think we'll really focus now on getting things uh, done, getting uh, say the regulatory side of things in order uh, with our proposals. We'll I'll uh, uh, I mean I I will promise to Marius that we will we will work uh, to uh, to ensure full consistency. Um, and we are taking concrete steps actually also on the international cooperation. So also with uh, Alison and others uh, looking forward very much to that. We'll 
the FATF work. Uh, uh, we'll now chair a new uh, co-chair, a new group at the FSB on digital identity. So we really want to get to concrete uh, also progress at the international level. Um, and, uh, and I think that's where we have to uh, take it. And I would expect the same indeed also from the private sector that uh, one continues to basically point fingers to the concrete issues, uh, but also then indeed uh, uh, move forward with, with solutions to those. So looking forward very much to this uh, continued work, which, which will be uh, a lot of work. And uh, uh, I think continues to be a lot of work. It has already been a lot of work and it will continue to be so. But it's good to see that the direction of travel, there seems, seems to be a lot of uh, consensus, actually. Thank, thank you. I'm, I'm sure many people will appreciate the, um, your, your comments then on the global uh, dimension of this and, and, and cooperation going forward. I think, I think personally that's extremely important. So I'd like to thank um, all, all of you uh, for your sharing your thoughts on, on the panel. Um, uh, Richard, Matt, Alison, Emmanuel, Marius and, and Jan, thank you very much.